All right. Anton, can I get you to say something? Sure. Yeah, here we go. Yeah. All right. For some reason, we need somebody on your end to talk in order to bring the camera back to you guys. So. All right. All right. We're ready to begin uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 8. Uh, he begins verse 8 with therefore. Uh, and the therefore goes back to what Paul had been saying in verse 7 regarding the fact that he has been appointed a preacher, an apostle, and a teacher. And since I've been given this responsibility, therefore, this is, as an apostle of Christ, what I want. And he says, I want the men in every place to pray. The I want is the uh, Greek word bulamai. And it is not a word that means, uh, you know, I, I have an opinion or uh, I kind of lean toward it being this way. Uh, the word has apostolic authority behind it. He is saying this is what I expect as an apostle of Christ to take place. He says, I want the men in every place to pray. Uh, the word for men here is a word in Greek that is uh, specific just for the male gender. So he's not talking generically like, uh, for example, in verse 1 when he says that prayer should be made on behalf of all men. Well, that's anthropos there. That's just mankind. That's people in general. In verse 8, though, it's a different word uh, from the Greek word aner, which refers specifically only to males. All right, this is what I want the males to do. And then he says, in every place to pray. Now, this particular phrase has created uh, some excitement on the part of uh, various people. As a matter of fact, some articles have been written in trying to explain the meaning of this particular phrase. But it is a phrase in which Paul is saying every place where prayers are going to be said and there is a plurality of people, men need to do it. He is not just talking about the assembly. He's including the assembly, but he's not just talking about the assembly. Now, Paul has the word ecclesia in his vocabulary, the, the Greek word that means the church, the assembly. Uh, he uses that word in 315. So, here he's trying to broaden the, the idea of what he's talking about, where He's not just saying, I want the men to pray in the assembly. But every place that you have a mixture of Christian men and Christian women, I want the men to do the praying. Now, the reason why this is important is because we asked the question about uh, devotionals. If we've got a devotional over at one of our houses, would it be okay... Uh, for the sisters to pray uh, in a situation like that. I mean, it's not the assembly of the church. It's just a bunch of us Christians uh, getting together, and we're going to sing some songs and say some prayers. Would that be okay? Not according to this verse. In every place where there are Christian men present, uh, Paul says, I want the men to pray. Well, a lot of teen groups will have... Uh, kind of a chain prayer where I'll, they'll just say, all right, we're going to go around the room and everybody just in order, uh, go ahead and, and say a prayer, prayer, pray whatever is on your mind. And Well, you've got girl and boy sitting next to each other around the circle. Would that be okay? No, it wouldn't be okay because of this verse here. Now, we need to, uh, uh, to be reminded that 1 Timothy 2 is not parallel with 1 Corinthians 14. 
uh, 1 Corinthians 14 is talking about the church. He says, I do not allow a woman uh, to, uh, uh, to talk in the church, in the assembly. All right, so that's what that's what he's talking about there. Here he's broadening the uh, the context in which acts of worship are going to be done, and he's talking about in every place. Now, this particular phrase "in every place" actually occurs four times in the New Testament. It occurs here. It occurs in First Corinthians uh, one and verse two. Double check, make sure I've got that right. Yeah, First Corinthians one and verse two, First Thessalonians one and verse eight, and Second Corinthians two and verse fourteen. And some have tried to suggest that in every one of these four occurrences, it always means the assembly of the church, the Sunday morning uh, assembly of the church. Well, when you look at those various verses, there's no way that you're going to come to that conclusion. So, uh, I present the following arguments. First of all, Paul has the word church in his vocabulary, and he doesn't use it here. Second of all, the phrase in the New Testament doesn't mean the church. Uh, and so that would uh, mitigate against that particular interpretation. And a third point that I think is worthy uh, to, to note is if Paul were wanting to say every place, whether we're talking about a devotional or we're talking about a, a group of Christians by the lake or by the river or at the park, and they're going to be doing some praying and so on. If he were wanting to say, in every one of those places, I want the men to do the praying, how in Greek would he express that particular thought? Well, I've asked that question to Greek scholars through the years, and every single one of them give me the same answer, and that is he would say it exactly like he says it here. Therefore, I believe we are correct in saying that Paul is eliminating women saying prayers in the presence of Christian men in any context. So if you've got a devotional over at the house or you've got a gathering of some Christians there uh, by the lake or at a park or something like that, it is not acceptable to God for women in that context to be praying. Now, someone will say, but in 1 Corinthians 11, it talks there about women praying and prophesying. Well, in what context are those women in 1 Corinthians 11 praying? Well, by putting these verses together, uh, we understand that those women are doing what they're doing in a context that would be acceptable to God, which would have them praying in front of non-Christians, praying in front of other women, maybe praying in front of children, but it would not be acceptable based upon this verse here uh, for her to be saying a prayer in the presence of Christian men. Paul says, I want the men to do this. And I don't want the women to step forward and there be the ones that do the praying. I want the men to do the praying. Alright, so uh, that's what this particular verse means. Now we remember that we've been talking about prayer uh, ever since verse 1. He says, I want prayers and treaties, uh, <coughs> petitions and thanksgivings to be made on behalf of all men. All right, so prayer is an important part of the Christian life. And in this book, we're talking about godliness and Godly people are praying people. And so it's important that we pray, but it's also important that we pray in such a way that it's going to be pleasing to God. And God does not want uh, women leading prayers in the presence of Christian men. 
Uh, any comments on that or questions, anybody? All right, then he says, <clears throat> I want the men in every place to pray, lifting up holy hands. Now, the Bible actually gives us a number of postures for prayer. Now, there are some that have uh, tried to suggest that this is the way that God wants uh, prayers to be said, with hands being lifted up. Well, two observations about that uh, particular suggestion. First of all, the, the Bible talks about prayers being said while someone's standing, uh, with heads being bowed, with their eyes lifted up toward the heaven, prayers being said while kneeling, prayers being said while falling prostrate on the ground, prayers being said with the head between the knees, uh, uh, prayers being said while one is beating the breast like in uh, Luke 18. And so to say that this is the posture for prayer uh, is not consistent with all of the different examples of uh, the postures for prayer that we have in the Bible. Second of all, Paul is not really talking about a posture for prayer. I want the men to lift up holy hands is what he's talking about. So he's using uh, somewhat of an example or a metaphor of, I'm not really talking about doing something physically with your hands, but instead, uh, I want the men who are going to be doing the praying, first of all, to be holy men. All right, this word is a, a word that has the idea of uh, someone who is clean, pious, spiritual, uh, godly, uh, devoted to God, pleasing to God. Uh, so his hands are those hands of someone who has been devoted to God during the week, who has been committed to doing the Lord's work. They're not hands that were defiled by sin, not hands that have been involved in iniquity, not hands that have been involved in uh, uh, stealing or mistreatment or anything along that line. They are holy men, godly men, men that have lived their lives in a way that's going to be pleasing to God. And then second, not only should the men that do the praying be holy men, but also he says they should be men without wrath. The, the word here, wrath, is the typical Greek word, orge, for uh, the idea of being filled with anger or rage. Uh, violent emotions. When one has anger in his heart, he cannot offer an acceptable prayer to God. The idea of prayer is uh, of communication, where we're coming before God with a humbleness of heart and love and devotion uh, toward God. And so if someone is praying to God and they're angry, maybe they're angry at God because they lost their job, or they're angry at God because they've been sick or somebody they love has been sick, or they're angry at God over uh, the economic situation of the nation or over the, the leadership of the nation. I don't know what, whatever they're angry about. They could be angry about things uh, along those lines. Well, that man uh, ought not to be praying. Uh, but this word also can tie in with the last word, and that is without wrath or dissension. Uh, the word is dialogismos, and it's the idea of arguing or disputing. Uh, the New Revised Standard has the word arguing. The NIV has disputing. Uh, the English Standard Version has quarreling. Uh, <clears throat> the New King James kind of goes a different direction than uh, most of the other translations with the word doubting. They, uh, and that's a possible meaning here, where <clears throat> the, man, the, the man that says the prayer does not need to be a man that doubts whether God's really there or doubts 
that God will answer prayer if He is there, or doubts <clears throat> whether God even cares about uh, what we're praying. But uh, uh, it's probable that the earlier uh, examples of th what this word means are correct, and that is that uh, the guy is... Uh, He's got an argument or he's disputing. And that could mean that uh, he, he's got a bone to pick with God. He's, he's not, not happy with uh, maybe the way some things are working out or the way uh, that he feels like God is dealing with him or dealing with his church. Or maybe when we put both of these words together without wrath and dissension, the dissension is with the brothers. And he is someone that uh, is really not getting along with uh, some of the other men of the church. Years ago, I visited a church in another state, and it, it wasn't Kentucky, and it wasn't Colorado, um, in which uh, uh, I wasn't preaching. I was just uh, sitting uh, uh, there in the audience, and my son started crying and uh, was getting kind of loud during the prayer, and so... Uh, I thought, well, I better pick him up and, and carry him out. So I picked him up, and while I'm carrying him out, I saw something that I thought I would never in my life see. And that was everybody on the side of the auditorium that I was sitting on, they all had their heads bowed in prayer. But everybody on the other side of the auditorium had their heads up, their eyes open, they're looking around. One guy was reading the newspaper, another guy was reading the bulletin. And I couldn't believe what I was seeing. So I got to the back of the auditorium, and uh, and I'm looking again to make sure that I saw what I saw. And sure enough, everybody on that side prayed, and everybody on the other side is not praying. Well, after the services were over, I told the preacher what it was that I saw. And he goes, yeah, we've got a real unity problem in this church. The, the man that was praying is one that uh, everybody on the side that you were sitting on, uh, they're his relatives and his friends, and so they're, they're praying with him. But everybody on the other side are those that they're from different families and there have been some family disputes. He said, this congregation's like the Hatfields and McCoys. And uh, so he goes, so what are we supposed to do? And I said, well, do you have any men in this congregation that when they lead in prayer, everybody could pray with those men? And he said, we probably have three. And I said, I would only have those men say the prayer. Because Paul says here, the men I want to pray are the men that are holy, the men that are without wrath, and they're not division creators. If you've got a man praying up there that half the congregation can't pray with, then you don't need to be having him uh, be saying a prayer. So that's an example of what uh, Paul's talking about here. But also... I believe that in most of our churches today, we've got a real problem in faithfully fulfilling 1 Timothy 2.8. And this is what I mean. Typically, those men that are in charge with assigning uh, men to do various things in worship will uh, uh, see Brother Smith. Brother Smith comes in, and Brother Smith hasn't been to worship now for four or five weeks well, let's get Brother Smith to do something. Brother Smith, would you be willing to say our closing prayer? Or Brother Smith, would you be willing to wait on the table? Uh, and the idea is, well, this will encourage Brother Smith to uh, uh, let him know that uh, you know we, uh, we still care about him and, and so on. Paul says here, no, do not do that. That's not what the church is uh, is supposed to be. The church is trying to reach the goal, and the goal is godliness. And if you don't have godly men that are leading in worship, then you're not going to be able to lead 
the church to godliness. This has been my experience. First of all, it doesn't work. You encourage Brother Smith, or you think you're encouraging Brother Smith to, uh, uh, by having him say a prayer or having him wait on the table. It doesn't change anything. That might be the only Sunday that Brother Smith is there for the next couple of months. And then he comes back again and you do the exact same thing. So first of all, that approach doesn't work. Second of all, what do you think it teaches Brother Smith about his own soul and his own salvation? Well, it teaches him, hey, apparently everything's okay because every time I come back, they put me right to work and treat me like, you know, nothing's changed. Well, it sends the wrong message to Brother Smith. And then third, it sends the wrong message to the church. So we've got people there that are in the audience and they say, you know, this is the first time I've seen Brother Smith in five weeks. But there he is right there. What does it teach them about commitment? Teach them about faithfulness? Well, it sends the wrong message uh, in every single uh, possibility that we can come up with. Paul says, don't do this. So, uh, in every place where I've had anything to do with selecting people for worship, we're not going to select the Brother Smiths. And uh, uh, they're not ever going to be involved. And I believe that by their being asked, we are in violation of 1 Timothy 2.8. Paul says, this is what I want. I want holy men to be leading the congregation in prayer. Well, if I understand the New Testament, men that uh, uh, forsake the assembly and only show up once every couple of months, they're not holy men. They're not faithful men to God. Uh, and so they have no place in leading God's people and uh, thinking about the greater context of 1 Timothy 2. Uh, they're certainly not going to be capable of leading the church to godliness. So... Uh, there are some important lessons, I think, uh, for us to learn. Uh, that man is not going to be able to lift up holy hands that uh, only worships God uh, with the saints every once in a while. Comments? Uh, you know, Brother Dean, I totally agree with that experience that the church I preached at. And uh, one thing that I did, of course, uh, one thing that I did, of course, with uh, somewhat limited knowledge on what I should do, uh, I would ask the men not to participate in worship if you know it. Because there are times that you might uh, not know uh, that a person is actually in sin. And uh, they might know it, but nobody else might not know it. So that being the case, you know, I asked the guys that they would be on an honor system with God. And if you know you're not right, if you know that there are some things in your life that prevent you from being in front of the church and being in the church, to sit down on your own. And of course, it works some, some, some of the time. And, uh, but actually, I believe if I had known what, what I've just learned in detail about First Timothy 2 and 8, I believe I could have handled that a lot better. So, but I just appreciate you and what you're saying about that verse because uh, it. It, uh, it um, really affected the church because I know many times the church knew what some of these men were doing. And uh, it definitely sent the wrong signal. So yeah. I'm still learning something. So just amen to what you just said. Well, I appreciate that. And it's, um, uh, it is something I believe that we need to give a lot more thought to. And, you know, I'm even leery about uh, somebody that's a visitor to a congregation. And you say, well, um, you know, you, you go visit with him, and he says, yeah, I'm a, a member of uh, such and such Church of Christ. Why well, would you be willing to say our closing prayer tonight? Uh, smaller congregations especially are uh, anxious to find anybody else to sort of share the load with. Well, you don't know that man. You don't really know uh, whether he meets the criteria that Paul gives here. And that is, he's a holy man. He doesn't have wrath in his heart or dissension in his life. And um, so, again, we've got to have 
I think Paul is saying our best men lead in worship. That's what we've got to have. And uh, otherwise, the church is not going to ever be able to rise above uh, or rise to the level of godliness that, uh, that God wants. All right. Any other comments on that? All right, then he goes on to say in verse 9, Likewise, I want women. Now, in every translation I'm familiar with, the, the words I want are in italics, and that means that uh, the words I want are not in the original text. And that would be accurate here. But our translators are correct in supplying the I want because of the word likewise. Likewise, I want. So the likewise is just like I want the men to do this, I want the women to do that. So uh, the, the way the Greek is structured demands the repetition of the I want. All right, then he says, I want the women. <coughs> Just as he used a word that was male-specific in verse 8, now he uses a word that is female-specific in verse 9. So he's talking only about the female gender. And so the instructions that we find in the following verses uh, are specific just to them. All right, what he says is, I want the women to adorn themselves with proper clothing. All right, it's interesting and significant that the very first part of what he has to say regarding women is involving clothing. Because the problem in the first century is the same problem in the 21st century, and that is that uh, of women dressing themselves in a way that's going to be appropriate. Now, this whole discussion is kind of centered around a clause that he has in the last part of verse 10. Notice that um, he says, as befits women making a claim to godliness. That's our key phrase. That's our key word for the book is godliness. And so when he's talking about what he wants the women to do, his instruction has to do with women that are going to make a claim to godliness. Other women who are not particularly interested in being godly are not going to heed Paul's instruction here. But those women who are wanting to be godly are going to listen uh, to what the inspired apostle is saying, and they are going to do uh, their very best in order to meet uh, this criteria. Alright? The word adorn is the Greek word cosmeo. We get the word con uh, cosmetics from this word. And here the, our translators have said to adorn themselves. And the idea is to uh, make oneself attractive uh, but the attraction should not be that which comes from, first of all, uh, immodest dress. When she clothes herself, it should be modest <coughs> clothing. The American Standard uses the word shamefastness, and the idea is that uh, she would not be ashamed with the clothes that she has on uh, in any context. Um, so, uh, if Jesus were there and she was standing before uh, the Lord himself, uh, would she be embarrassed uh, by what she has on? Would there be a level of shame <clears throat> to that? Uh, does it go beyond the boundaries of propriety? Uh, so, when he talks about uh, modest, that is one that, uh, that covers a gamut of uh, dress. For example, uh, it could be something that's showing too much skin. That would be immodest. Uh, it could be something that's too tight. Uh, maybe it co covers the skin, but it's too tight. Well, 
that would be immodest and would be a violation of this word. And then next he says that she should dress discreetly. The word uh, here has the idea of soundness of mind, where she thinks about what it is that she's putting on, and the idea is that she's thought about it to the extent that she does not want to draw attention to herself. Now, here is how this is different than the last word. How is discreet different than modest? Discreet can be very modest, uh, but something that's indiscreet could be loud. It could be flashy. It could be something that's yelling out, look at me. Uh, so if she's wearing something, it may be very modest as far as that's concerned, uh, but it's uh, maybe it's gaudy, it's flashy, it's something where uh, uh, maybe there's uh, a lot of color, a lot, a lot of jewelry, I don't know, something where it's going to draw attention to herself. That's what Paul is saying uh, is not the, the direction that a godly woman wants to go. When she's thinking about being with uh, other Christians in any kind of worship context, in every place, uh, Paul said, she has to give consideration to is it modest and is it discreet. She is not the center of attention, nor should she want to be as a godly woman, but rather... Uh, she's saying, how would my God want me to dress? Now, to some extent, Paul answers the question of what he's talking about. Uh, not with braided hair, gold or pearls or costly garments. <clears throat> what we know from uh, a number of writers who have studied documents that come from the first century uh is that women during this time would spend considerable attention to uh, their hair, to their jewelry. Uh, the, the braiding of hair was that in the first century uh, that uh, was something that was done uh, by the rich. And it was a, a way that was kind of being flashy and showy. And uh, that's what he was talking about when he... Uh, we're talking about discreetly. Um, and when you put it together with the gold or pearls or costly garments, uh, you can see the context in which Paul is talking about, and that is uh, she's doing that, which is, is going to draw attention to herself. So this is not a, a verse that's condemning the braiding of hair, uh, but in the first century, the braiding of hair gave a very different message back then than it necessarily would today in that uh, uh, women today that might have braided hair uh, are not screaming, look at me, whereas that was uh, what was happening in the first century as, where at, at, as uh, well as costly garments and lots of expensive jewelry. Um, 1 Peter 3 and verse 3 talks about the, uh, the putting on of dresses and things along that line. Well, uh, does that mean that uh, wearing a dress is something prohibited? Well, obviously not. We've got to understand contextually what Paul and Peter are both saying, and it has to do with uh, clothing that's designed to draw attention to oneself. Now, there's another point here that I... Uh, believe is worth our uh, considering. There are a number of people that have struggled with 1 Corinthians 11 and what Paul says there about women wearing veils. And they've wondered, is that something that uh, is an, ex uh, uh, an expectation of God for uh, women of all uh, all cultures and all generations. Well, I believe by looking at this passage along with 1 Corinthians 11, 
And we can answer that question, and here's how. The word veil is a word that means a covering. Uh, some women today uh, think that they believe that you need to wear a veil, just wear a little something on their head, a little doily or a little uh, handkerchief. That's not what the Bible word means. The Bible word means a covering. And it is a word that uh, would be something like uh, what uh, um, Muslim women would wear, the burqa, that where uh, there's nothing exposed except their face. It's the same Greek word, the word covering, that is used both by James and First Peter to talk about what God does uh, with our sins. He covers our sins. Well, I don't know about you, but I don't want my sin to just have a little... I want God to cover, bury my sins. And uh, that's the word that Paul is using there. All right. So, this is my point. If Paul is saying in 1 Corinthians 11 that women need to wear a covering, then you wouldn't see whether the hair was braided or not. You wouldn't see the hair at all because the veil would completely cover it. Apparently, the women in 1 Timothy 2, which are in a different city, they're in Ephesus, and obviously 1 Corinthians is talking about the women in Corinth. <clears throat> the women in Ephesus were not wearing veils because if they were wearing veils, then he wouldn't be talking about their hair at all. <clears throat> so here is a rule of Bible interpretation. When you have two passages that are talking about the same thing, but those passages are giving different messages. It's a cultural teaching. So what Paul is telling the women in Corinth is not what he's telling the women in Ephesus to do. Uh, so it was a cultural thing in Corinth, and therefore women today do not need to wear veils. Comments on that? Yes. Um, as far as the women's clothing, what came to my mind was um, women who intentionally wear, well, like an Amish woman who wears something totally different from anyone else. Is she is she bringing attention to herself and therefore yeah. wrong? Yeah. Doing that? Any, that's right. Uh, anything that is uh, basically saying, look at me, is what uh, uh, Paul is saying uh, would be in violation. So, yeah. Any other comments? All right, so he says, I want the women to adorn themselves with proper clothing, modestly and discreetly, not with braided hair, gold and pearls, or costly garments, but, verse 10, rather by means of good works, now, the but shows us that don't adorn herself with physical things, but rather adorn herself with something like good works. All right. It isn't the hairstyle, the jewelry, the clothing that's really going to make a woman attractive. A godly woman is not attractive uh, by those external things. But you know what? A good a woman that's engaged in good works, that is an attractive woman that is properly clothed uh, with those good works. And he says, as befits women making a claim to godliness. That's what fits the woman. Gaudy jewelry, flashy clothes, that is not what fits a godly woman at all. But this does. When you look at a godly woman, you would expect her to manifest the characteristics of godliness in her life by the things that she does. A life of selfless devotion to others, being involved in the work of the church, uh, that's what uh, makes women attractive. And that's what a godly woman is going to focus on. 
Then he says in verse 11, Let a woman quietly receive instruction with entire submissiveness. Verse 12, But I do not allow a woman to teach or to exercise authority over a man, but to remain quiet. All right, he says twice, I want a woman to quietly do something. Quietly receive instruction, verse 11, uh, and to remain quiet, verse 12. This is the same Greek word that we had back in verse 2. For kings and all those who are in authority, in order that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life, in all godliness. Now, some have supposed, and our English translations uh, maybe haven't helped us here by translating the word quiet, uh, to have supposed that this word means without sound, and that a woman is to receive instruction without making any sounds at all. Uh, verse 12, not to teach or exercise uh, but to remain totally without sound, quiet. Well, there actually is a Greek word that means that, uh, and that's the word that Paul uses in 1 Corinthians 14. It's the Greek word sigao, S-I-G-A-O. Sometimes it's got a T in there, sigato. Uh, <clears throat> but that's the word when Paul, there in 1 Corinthians 14.34, says that women need to, to be quiet, uh, that's a different Greek word than the word we have here in 1 Timothy chapter 2. There he's saying, in the assembly, a woman is never to speak. She is never to address the assembly. All right, that's the context of 1, Tim 1 Corinthians 14. Here, he's talking about in every place, a woman needs to have an attitude of quietness. Uh, well, that doesn't mean without sound. We're not going to live our lives without sound in verse 2. We're not praying that our rulers will uh, present, uh, give us an environment where we no longer say anything. Now, the reason why I'm even bringing this up is because the question is asked, can a woman in Bible class say anything? All right, you've got Christian men and Christian women that are all together in a, in a Bible class. Uh, can a woman make a comment? Can a woman ask a question? And some, by misunderstanding the meaning of this word here, have said, no, she is to be quiet and only be that which receives instruction. Well, if that were what Paul was wanting to say, he would have used here the same word that he used in 1 Corinthians 14, that sigao word. But uh, he uses the different word here, hesukia, and that this word, uh, this has the idea of a, a, a calm, quiet demeanor, but it certainly doesn't mean and never has meant uh, to be without sound. So in the environment in which Paul is talking about in every place where Christians are together and instruction is going on, women need to not be the teacher, but need to be the learner. And being a learner uh, what might involve asking a question, uh, making a comment for clarification, or something along that line. So this passage does not condemn uh, a woman uh, making a comment or asking a question in a Bible class. But what it does say is that there are two prohibitions given to women here. First of all, women are not to teach. The word that Paul uses here is a word that conveys the idea of functioning in some official capacity. She is the teacher, uh, which 
uh, is the idea that Paul has in mind. Now, the reason why I'm, I'm bringing this up is because giving somebody information that somebody else did not know does not make someone a teacher. No one would ever, the word is didoskalos. You would never call someone a didoskalos. So let's say we've got our classes here and uh, a woman would say, uh, well, what Jesus said on the Sermon on the Mount would also apply here as well. And maybe there's a man over here that he never even thought about that. He just learned something. Well, is he going to say, you're a teacher? <laughs> no. Just because somebody says something that gives information to someone else, you're not calling them a teacher. A teacher is someone that is fulfilling some official capacity in, uh, in some context. Uh, so if a, if a woman is in a Bible class and makes a comment that somebody else didn't know, well, she's not the teacher. She's not a teacher, and so Paul is not condemning that at all. Instead, what he's saying is she is not to be the, the didoskalos, the teacher. Uh, that in the church and in every place where Christian men and women are uh, together, this is not the role that uh, God has in mind for women. He does not want them to be the teacher. Paul says, verse 12, I do not allow a woman to teach. All right, then second, he says, I do not allow a woman to exercise authority. Now, some have said that the exercise authority is uh, teaching as an example, or actually teaching is what he means. Uh, so they would translate this, I do not allow a woman to teach. That is, exercising authority by teaching over a man. But that's not what Paul is saying here. He uses a word, or, that is separating these two. I do not allow a woman to teach, that's one thing, or to do that which exercises authority. All right, this is something that we want to spend some time talking about, and so uh, what we'll do is we'll pick up right there <laughs> next Wednesday night and talk about what exercising authority means. It's appreciate everybody there in, in Paducah uh, being in the class, and you have a good rest of the week, and we'll see you next Wednesday night. Thank you.